What is the intellectual dark web anyway? If you've spent time in the political YouTube world, which we assume that you guys do, you've probably heard the name Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson, and Brett Weinstein. Friend of the show, Michael Brooks, he has a new book. It's called The Web, A Cosmopolitan Answer to the New Right. In it, Michael looks at some of the rise of these prominent so-called renegades. He responds to some of their arguments, and he outlines how the left can build a stronger audience online. Michael joins us now via Skype. He's also the host of The Michael Brooks Show and a great friend of our show. Michael, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Great to see you guys. Good morning. Of course. Michael, tell us, why did you decide to write the book? What, what is the main thrust of your argument there? Well, I decided to write the book. They asked me to write the book in 2018 when these guys were still relevant. So that was when I initially decided to write it. But uh, look, I think, uh, you know, it's funny because there's no doubt that like that exercise in self-branding is kind of done in some ways. I mean, people, there's, there's still a presence from that kind of scene online and they have a good amount of followers, but they certainly are not getting New York Times profiles or the kind of heat that they were a couple of years ago. But I think what's interesting is that these guys present a couple of different styles of right-wing arguments. Uh, in fact, pretty different in some ways from some of the more kind of populist stuff uh, that you're into, Sagar, which obviously I disagree mm -hmm. with in some key ways, but I think is much more uh, relevant to actual, like at least it has an analysis of what's actually happening in today's world, right? Sure. So these are guys who are primarily, I would say, kind of, uh, fixated on justifying uh, hierarchies that are, you know, socially, politically produced, and then not wanting to look at uh, the reason why things have come into play, right? Like mm -hmm. capitalism is just good. Capitalism is like science. Capitalism is like biology, as an example. We can't necessarily, you know, deconstruct the way we regulate certain markets, as an example, because then that can like throw us into chaos. This is more like a Jordan Peterson thing. So there is a criticism of all of these arguments, but I think more importantly, what the book does is it looks at why, what are the failings on the left that have led to this? What are the kind of answers that people are looking for that arguments like this can provide? Because they're still going to be out there even after these guys kind of like leave the scene. And then maybe most importantly, like what is a confident, uh, you know, sort of globally appealing left that really speaks to the needs of the moment? Well, mm. dig into that why. Why was there? Because clearly they, these guys all have massive um, followings and audiences online. There was a media fixation on some of them, but it wasn't just a media fixation. They really spoke to people in a way that was compelling for a large number of people. What do you, what, what do you um, attribute that to? Yeah, I think there's three things. I think one is there's definitely, you know, there's definitely aggrievement. There's no doubt about that and some self-victimization going on. And that's kind of like the standard sort of lefty critique. And there's some truth to it, no doubt. I think then there's also um, this element of self-help almost and finding meaning and purpose and trying to be able to navigate your life. Um, and figure out sort of big questions. I mean, even, you know, there's a big spectrum there, but even a guy like Sam Harris will like, you know, teach people meditation as an example, right? I think that that's actually really important for a lot of people. That's again, another thing that maybe the left needs to rethink how they approach. People are going to want uh, tools and tactics and strategies and ideas about how to live better, how to navigate their lives, right? And even as we talk about systemic problems, we can't discount people trying to figure out their own lives, right? Uh, and then three, I think that they were able to make a lot of plays out of this sort of like woke scold culture, basically. So well, that like yeah. if your only representation of liberals is, hey, you know, shut up. That's not right. Uh, you can, you know, there's an open field there. Well, I was going to say, Michael, I think that that really was is what drove more than anything, was a lot of this kind of like free speech on campus stuff that really broke out into the scene in 2015, kind of culminated exactly in what you're talking about in 2018. What are the, I mean, I think it bears some self-reflection that the left allowed itself to get defined very much by that cohort. And what, why is it that that happened? What is the failure? Why do you think it petered out? That's another interesting question. Why did it peter out after 2018? And what were the failures that led to it becoming such a defining force in politics, at least for a little while? 
Well, I think you're – look, I think you're right about some of that. I have a different approach to even just strategically how I would handle those kinds of arguments and conflicts. And I think, in fact, the left could be a lot more confident, to be honest. Now, I think partially, though, they also petered out because, you know, they're ridiculous in the sense <laughs> that, like, this is not a ser- – you know, to – Look at legislation as an example, as some of them have done to try to control what professors can say on college campuses is a way bigger threat to free free speech and open discourse than a couple of college students, you know, uh, like freaking out. Right. Or, you know, or even more broadly, if you, you know, look at somebody like Glenn Greenwald, who is more on the left. That's a free speech, open society person across the board. So I think that people started to get kind of drawn if they were sincerely interested in that stuff, they were like, wait a second, I think there's people who are interested in politics related to free speech, legal decisions related to free speech, cultivating a culture of free speech, not just whining about it not happening in certain places. And then incidentally, having their own kind of like very well-developed high sensitivity to certain types of ideas and discourse, right? Like Joe Rogan's kind of an outlier in this group because I think he really does represent in some ways like the center and he is open to a lot of different ideas and arguments pretty much across the spectrum but for most of these guys they are just as whiny as and, and as offended and as aggrieved by you know oh how could you say that about one of my heroes as anybody else right mm-hmm. so they really undercut their brands and i i think also that as a left started to emerge uh you know that is more significant and i think a kind of cohort that you know i'm part of uh, that really started to say, like, I, you know, look, I don't know about all of these various kind of controversies, but I do know that you don't have health care. <laughs> I do know that you don't have a position in the 21st century economy. And then, in fact, it actually doubly exposed them in some ways for their own shortcomings, but also that they didn't really have uh, answers and they don't have answers to the big questions. Hmm. Did you find, though, any of their arguments compelling? Was there any piece of it that you thought the left should learn from or embrace? You know, what's hard about it is I would like to say yes if they applied it coherently. Like my my publisher, Doug Lane, is a guy – it's funny. You know, he's a Marxist. But the dude is a total free speech, like, absolutist, right? Like he really – and he takes all of these kind of like – debate notions, which probably I make fun of too much, like, you know, hey, like, you got to take on this argument in good faith and so on. He actually takes that really seriously and really sincerely. And and it's very interesting in seeing how he approaches people and the work he does. And I think, frankly, we could all learn a significant amount from that in terms of kind of building out stronger arguments, having more patience and um, really being analytical. Uh, I think the shortcoming of this group so often though is that I did not see them applying those same principles outwards like I saw a lot of you know uh, at times maybe justified critiques but I also did not see them you know kind of doing it themselves Uh, I think you know the self-help stuff and the questions about finding meaning and purpose I don't really buy their answers, but I think they're 100% right to ask those questions. And that needs to be something that we're at the very least comfortable with and really actually providing, uh, you know, people who are interested in having their own conversations about because it's relevant to people's lives. Yeah, I'm glad you acknowledge that because, you know, I've actually, I've, you know, I've, I listened to some of these guys have for years and I, I agree with you. I don't think that, the, you know, it's like if you listen to some of them, you'd think free speech on campus is the underlying most important issue. <laughs> facing America. And I'm like, well, there's right. a few more systemic economic critiques maybe. that I would yeah. maybe embrace. But you're correct to identify that, look, you know, whenever there are people out there who are looking for meaning, so to speak, I've spoken with Jordan Peterson, actually, about this very subject, is that it, it's very much speaking to a society. And I think we have deeper systemic critiques of why this would leave people feeling meaningless and void of meaning in their lives. I think you and I would say this is about a systemic societal critique. They would say it's more individualistic and you can work your way out of it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that trying to look for meaning is a bad thing. So I'm glad that you recognize that. A hundred percent. And it's a feedback loop. I mean, I think that this is another thing maybe that could be added on. Like, of course, we're totally interdependent. 
of course this is you know societally impacted of course this is economically formed uh in terms of the crisis in so many people's lives and then of course not only do people need to find and shape their own kind of uh meaning in the context of it their ability to you know create that meaning is gonna is gonna also impact how they take on collective endeavors so like yeah i mean i think you know in the i did in the jordan peterson chapter i think his actual ideas and frameworks i just don't buy and i actually i think there's people in who do somewhat overlapping stuff in a much more interesting way like scott atron is an anthropologist who studies why young people join terrorist organizations and he's like an actual ethnographer who's worked extensively across the world and he finds some very interrelated dynamics like across the board, right? In terms of what kind of social and personal crises can lead to that. And he has some really interesting insights about generating sense of purpose and meaning. So I think that the answers are there, the approaches are there that are more dynamic and more interesting, but we should never mock people uh, or alienate them for trying to find those answers. And also, even if they are like, relatively privileged in other ways. It, it mm. kind of doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. I Good think point. that's really well said. Um, Michael, congrats on the book. Where should people go to get it? I would go to this place called Red Emma's in Baltimore. It's a buddy of mine. He owns an independent bookstore. Obviously, they're not open right now because of all of this, but they are doing mail orders and supposedly people bailing on Amazon and, and uh, ordering the book there because, you know, fortunately, folks are out there ordering this book. Thank you. Uh, is is helping them in this time. Well, so I promote that anyways, but particularly now. And awesome. I appreciate it, guys. Well, I read, I read the book. It's really good. Read Emma's. We'll try to post the link in the comments. So send me that link, Michael. Um, congrats again. Thank it. you so much. Thank you, Michael. Take care, guys. Mm -hmm. Stay safe. Coming up, Instacart's grocery delivery workers staged a walkout this week. All Instacart gig worker, one Instacart gig worker is going to tell us what it's like on the front lines and whether management is meeting any of their demands. That's next.